Howdy folks, Steampunk Desperado here. Today is another brief review. This is of a book I recently finished reading. It's called Fitzpatrick's War by Theodore Judson, 2004 Daw Books. And you can see I have the hardcover. Why? Because it wasn't available in ebook or audiobook. <laughs> and I usually pick the other two because they're more convenient. I get through a lot of books. I'm a fanatic. So nonetheless, it's kind of cool to have the hardcover. So I found this on the Wikipedia list of steampunk works, but one of the reasons I am reviewing this is because it got a mention on a very prominent YouTube channel, not my own, <laughs> and I thought it's going to draw some attention. I hope the author gets some sales from that because it's an interesting and well-crafted book about which I have rather mixed feelings. But anyway, the channel that reviewed it was What If Alt Hist. It's got a young guy named Rudyard. He's like only 22 years old, yet he's rather conservative and he has this viewpoint about, uh, you know, history and the way the world is headed. And so he's got a lot of followers, but YouTube also does a lot of uh, pointing people to rebuttals and debunking, supposedly. I don't know I've made it when they start debunking my videos, to be perfectly honest. So he had an interesting take on this, which I'll get to later. Now, this is not the kind of rollicking steampunk adventure that I usually review. It's a steampunk in the post-apocalyptic sense. It takes place in the 25th century, and we have, like, steam technology, uh, but they don't have electricity. At least the common people don't. They have zeppelins and all this cool stuff. Uh, so it's kind of regressed, and it's got a very puritanical culture, which makes it very Victorian in, in a feel. It's a history of the renowned statesman and conqueror Isaac Prophet Fitzpatrick by his uh, longtime friend and comrade and underling Robert Mayfair Bruce. They usually have these middle names that are rep represent some sort of virtue so they're very pilgrim's pro progress in that sense you know your middle name is like perseverance or courage or something like that and Bruce as far as I know it, of it is no relation to the 14th century Scottish king. But it's kind of cool that the author chose that name. The setting, the world is dominated by a number of empires and confederations. Uh, Bruce's nation is the Yukon Confederacy, which roughly corresponds to what we can now call the Anglosphere. That is, British Isles, North America, Australia, New Zealand, and a few other places thrown in. It is a spiritual successor to the British Empire. In fact, their flag is the Union Jack. They have a very conservative culture, even stodgier uh, than Victorian England. In fact, they consider dancing to be immoral. You know, like uh, doing a waltz with your wife, that's absolutely shocking. You know, they, they would not tolerate that in public. <laughs> now, Yukon refers to a reactionary agrarian group. They kind of, kind of like a prepper back to the land group that arose in the 21st century in light of all the chaos of the storm times, as they told them. And people called them Yukons because it was like they came out of nowhere, like the Canadian Arctic, <laughs> you know, and they adopted the name. They thought, yes, that's cool. We like it. And so they took over. So they renamed the country the Yukon Confederacy. And so they have a very rigid class structure with a lot of uh, nobility and so on. And Bruce, the narrator, he's a commoner who came to prominence because he's a war hero. There was this like war on the Mexican border and he distinguished himself. So he was sent to this military academy to study military engineering because he's a math genius. And he meets Fitzpatrick there. He's the son of the consul, which kind of means it's like a Roman emperor, <laughs> you know? And he becomes his Fitzpatrick's favorite or one of his favorites. Fitzpatrick undertakes to conquer the world in the manner of his idol, Alexander the Great. <laughs> And at first, Bruce is really on board with this, but then as time goes by, his Christian morality starts to kick in and he realizes that uh, they're doing some pretty horrible things <laughs> in order to accomplish this. So back to What If All Tist. Rudyard mentions this book on his show about Mouse Utopia. Anyway, Mouse Utopia was an experiment that was done way back when. I remember hearing about it as a teenager, so it's a long time ago, in which they took a bunch of lab mice and they put them in an environment where they were very crowded. They had enough to eat, 
but very crowded, and they began behaving very antisocially, including attacking each other and not reproducing. And, and Rudyard likens this to our current society, that our birth rate has dropped and that we have a lot of violence and crime, and that's part of what is happening to us. Now, he mentions Fitzpatrick's War as an example of a story that involves this concept. Though it is kind of a small part of the book, there's several things I took away from it. Uh, so, more on the book now. now. I'm conflicted about recommending this book because it is not the kind of steampunk adventure that I usually enjoy. It is, is too long and is slowly paced. On the other hand, it is well written. It's got a complex fictional world, well crafted, and well rounded characters, and some real moral dilemmas. Uh, the part I enjoyed the most was the fact that this biography takes place 500 years in the future, 600 years in the future, an editor is remarking on Bruce's work, saying, oh, this is a lie. You know, he's, he's trying to slander our great man Fitzpatrick uh, because he, there's an official history and there's the true history, which is what Bruce is telling. So that's the first point I took away from this, is that history is bunk. And I love this point, uh, in that the editor is saying all these footnotes like, that would have never happened. A Yukon woman would never swear at her husband. <laughs> well, no. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Uh, it's one of my favorite arguments. It's kind of like the no true Scotsman fallacy. You know, no, true, no Scotsman would do that. Well, a Scotsman did. Well, then no true Scotsman would do it. <laughs> uh, so that's the first fun part about it. Second part is good is that and that is a good lesson is that civilizations rise and fall and they have a period of, of vibrancy and growth and they have a period of decadence and decline. And that happens to the American empire in this book. And that doesn't get enough coverage. They talk about some old movies that, that Bruce gets to watch. His movies are very rare and the commoners don't get to see them. But in the academy, they see them. There's this horrible violence and extreme sickening decadence of the 21st century. I'd like to see more of that, um, but it's kind of a small part. The uh, Yukon Confederacy is now becoming decadent, and it's going to rise and probably fall as well, right? Or maybe not. Third point is that it's hard to be moral in the real world. Uh, there's all these dilemmas, and uh, poor Bruce has all these moral quandaries. You know, how can I be moral? I'm in the military. If I disobey orders, I'll be shot. And uh, another character is his wife, Charlotte. She's this feisty Irish gal, and she's his moral compass. Very, very fun character. And she wants him to be good. She wants him to be just and to not commit war crimes <laughs> and so on. And so that's part of the conflict, which is pretty cool. Fourth point is that behind the scenes, there are sinister forces pulling the strings of the world's powers. And that's kind of like an Illuminati. World Economic Forum, uh, Davos thing, which, you know, a lot of people believe nowadays, and, and I have mixed feelings about them, but nonetheless, it's pretty interesting and fascinating. There's this group called the Timer Men in this book, and they are the people who keep the old technology from the 21st century. They have satellite surveillance. They have radio communication. Nobody else has it. And because they favor the Yukon Confederacy over the other countries, the Yukons get that leg up. And, but they are at the same time, they are manipulating the Yukons. And they may even be leading them into disaster. The only problem is that we don't see much about this until the very end in the epilogue when, uh, Bruce receives some enlightenment from one of the timer men that he encountered early in the book. So there's hints, but not much about it. In Judson's defense, I gotta say, that is written very much realistically like a biography, like an actual person would write about an actual person. It's a limited point of view. Bruce doesn't know about all these things, so we can't write about them. And it's all these experiences, all the misery he went through, and his assignment in India, preparing for the war with China, and very well done, like I said, but too long. It takes too long to get to the meat of the matter. And so a lot of people will quit reading the book. I was tempted to. If I wasn't OCD, I probably would have quit. So I recommend it with reservations. You gotta be a history buff 
you got to be really into this civilization stuff in order to enjoy it. And you have to persevere because <laughs> it's going to take you a while to get to the good stuff. This has been my review of Fitzpatrick's War by Theodore Judson. A very interesting and noteworthy book. Let me know what you think about it. Please like and subscribe. And also check out my works on Amazon. Links are in the description. For now, this is the Steampunk Test Writer saying adios amigos in the Steampunk Test Writer channel where the past meets the future and the present is extraordinary. Thank you.